If you love black music, you gotta check out Cue Points. I'm Sir Daniel and I'm a DJ. I'm Jay Ray, a lover of black music history. Join us as two music heads give you the lowdown on everything from the dopest MCs to hip hop and fashion. Listen to Cue Points on your favorite podcast platform and check out our website at cuepoints.com. That's Q U E U E points.com. Yes, welcome back to another episode of Q Points Podcast. I am DJ Sir Daniel. And my name is Jay Ray, sometimes known by my government as Johnny Ray Cornegay III. Good evening, folks. Yes, Jay Ray, I, listen. This episode, this episode right here, if y'all know me, you know I'm a. there's only a few things that I'm a complete nerd and a stand about. And this episode, the topic of this episode is one such topic. I am, I promise I'm not going to go overboard. I promise I'm not going to talk too much or talk over my, my co-host here, but it's about to go down on this particular episode. And I am so happy that you are here. Jay Ray, I'm especially happy that you are here to share this with me because you really are the one that put the battery in my back and was like, we need to do this show and we need you to nerd out over this particular topic. Yes. Like I am so excited. I'm going to learn stuff tonight. I legit, this is probably the one show I'm going to go strictly off feeling because I didn't even go into like my research bag and like try and find out all this history. I'm like, I'm going to listen to Professor Uncle Sir Daniel. <laughs> and we're going to have a good time. Um, this crew doesn't get a lot. There, I haven't read a lot, and I haven't mm-hmm. definitely haven't seen a lot that talks about this crew. And I think the fact that Herbie's Machine was released in 1988, so we're at the uh, 35th anniversary yes. um, means we need to spend some time here, especially given the conversation that we had about a uh, house party. So we just scratched the surface on Kit and Play's impact. And now we get to dive into where that even came from. So I think that's fun. Absolutely. But before we get to all of that goodness, um, we want to, we have some business that we need to take care of because the listener needs to know what they can do and how they can, what they need to do to support us, support Q points and make sure that we continue to bring you quality show episodes like this one. And um, yeah, tell them exactly what they need to do, J Ray. Absolutely. So all of y'all, wherever you are listening or watching at this moment, the first thing that you can do is hit the subscribe button. That is the easiest way to support our show. Um, And then the next thing that you can do that's also absolutely free is sharing the show with your friends. So go ahead and hit the share button, send them a text, send them an email, send them a DM in threads or whatever. You can't send DMs in threads. So don't send a DM there, but send them a DM somewhere and let them know about Q points, um, because if you love it, they'll probably love it too. If you want to go a step further and are like, yo, I want to keep the lights on over at Q points, you can become a member, a Q points insider by visiting our website and, um, clicking the subscribe button. Um, and that uh, really does help to support us as well. And you can shop at our store, Q points, um, I'm sorry, uh, store.qpoints.com. And uh, one last thing that you can do, and this is also free, um, is join our mailing list uh, at magazine.qpoints.com. We are now doing two uh, emails a week, which are giving you 
information that's kind of behind the scenes about the show yes we'll of course talk about the shows that we've done but we'll also give you some behind the scenes information too so that's another way that you can support the show let's just break it down first and foremost so idol makers is the name of a crew that herbie love Bugs started herbie azor um but affectionately known as herbie the love bug um started a crew not unlike j ray like the juice crew mm -hmm. um boogie down productions flavor unit. Mm -hmm. the flavor unit now the thing the distinction that he does have is that prior to that there probably was only like the the juice crew might have been the only like formation of of hip-hop mcs that were uh, were put together right mm -hmm. that had a um that had a um a conglomerate together and they you know they had in-house production so on and so forth with marley marl well herbie the love bug did the same thing except herbie love bug in my opinion j ray and i've said this time and time again one does not get enough credit for the work that he has done in the culture and two um, Herbie Lovebug is probably, I refer to him as hip hop's Barry Gordy. Now, before I used to say he was Diddy before he, there was a Diddy, which is true. Mm -hmm. But if you want to really take it back, J Ray listener, uh, Herbie the Lovebug really patterned himself after Barry Gordy. If we know what we know about Barry Gordy is that Motown was a, a in-house machine. Mm -hmm. Everything was there right producers songwriters but when it came to rap music to the actual music of the culture you know people were pretty much putting out 12 inches and just doing their thing with no with they were like um uh blank 12 inches mm -hmm. no artwork not a lot of photog photography so that you can know who the artist is what they look like um but that kind of changed when herbie lovebug came around and brought that aspect that grasp of music as a business and artistry hmm. you know he brought those two together you know i'm i never thought about this before but thank you for framing herbie in that way and i'm wondering if we don't talk about him the way that we should because herbie was also doing this type of work in hip-hop at a time when hip-hop was very concerned with realness and staying yes. true to the street and mm -hmm. herbie was when you look at even when i went back and looked at old dana um dana dane uh live performances salt and pepper videos kit and play videos i'm like oh these are kind of polished where it was being packaged up in a way that still you know was definitely black at its core because these are black people but mm -hmm. it also was kind of it was lending itself to like a pop sensibility like herbie knew how to make a radio hit you know what i'm saying um yes. and that could be one of the reasons why we don't regard him in that way. It's because when he was doing what he was doing, it was not, it was not hip fashionable and hip hop to do. And his, his, his height was at that time, right? If Herbie was right. doing, was still doing that type of work today, we probably be having that conversation where this, this is how influential he was, but I'm glad we're doing this show because I think you're right. Um, he was more like hip hop's Barry Gordy. Absolutely. So, so going back to that point, we're talking about, so the name of his production crew was the Invincibles. Mm -hmm. So that's the production crew. And what I, what I've always noticed when I would look at the, the liner notes for anything that Herbie touched. I would always say see fingerprints Finger, yeah in the fingerprints in the uh where the um the the writer, the writer credit, credit would mm -hmm. be so come to find out that fingerprints is actually herbie's um uh, other alias 
is fingerprints, which makes so much sense because Herbie literally had his hands in every aspect from label negotiations to recruiting. Like he would, he would recruit DJs for each crew. Like he, a lot of folks don't know this, but uh, Sweet Tea and Jazzy Joyce were not a team. They were not a group in the beginning. Sweet Tea, Jazzy Joyce was recruited to um, to back up Sweet Tea once this record was, once he had this um, record in mind. And we're going to delve into a lot of those acts that you mentioned, um, because if we talk about, if I say to you, um, J. Ray, the Fresh Force, the Kango crew, and the Glamour Girls, do those mean anything to you? No, I'd be like, Sir Daniel, who are those people? I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so honestly, so Herbie, another thing that Herbie was excellent at is spotting talent and mm. recruiting talent. And so a lot of the people that we now know as Kid and Play started out as the Fresh Force. And for those of you who were who were really into your hip hop, if you remember a song called by Falco called Rock Me Amadeus, mm-hmm. the Fresh Force had a record called Rock Me, which was, uh, you know, had a little um, interpolation from the Falco record. So that was Kid and Play. They were known as Kid Kula and Playboy at the time. And you can if you listen to the record, you can hear the voices and you're like, oh yeah, that's definitely Kid and Play. But they weren't known as Kid and Play back then because they hadn't um, joined Herbie's crew at the time. So, and when I say um, the Glamour Girls, I'm talking about Sweet Tea and Glamorous, who was actually a part of the Juice crew. They got together and they recorded the answer record to the... um, Oh, what were their names? They did the song Veronica. Oh, Veronica, Veronica. Oh, yeah. Veronica girl. So they did that song. So Sweet Tea and Glamorous teamed up together and did the, the response over to Oh, Veronica. And so, um, and prior to that, Sweet Tea was also dropping records with um, Davy DMX. If you listen to that, the Davy DMX record, One for the Trouble, Two, Two for, for the, the Bass. bass. Mm-hmm. That's Sweet Tea. That's Sweet Tea and another young lady from England. So Sweet Tea had been doing rap records before getting to Herbie Lovebug. And the can and the Kango crew consisted of Dana Dane and Slick Rick. They were a group first. Oh, that's right. Yes. Oh, that's which is how Dana Dane started using the British affect. Right. They were putting out records and Slick Rick, of course, got commandeered by Dougie Fresh. Mm-hmm to do his um do the show and Lottie Dottie yep and of course that took off so people knew Dana Dane and Slick Rick as a crew Mm -hmm. but once Slick Rick became really popular for that Herbie helped Dana Dane to craft his own sound and that's how we got records like Delancey Street and of course Nightmares Mm -hmm. where he was able to craft his own sound and craft his own image aside from Slick Rick so I said the, I said all that to say is that Herbie and that Eye for Talent, yes, these people were already established, kind of, sort of, but he took them to another level. You know, he took yeah. Kid and Play. He gave they took on the um, the not the moniker of Kid and Play from the Fresh Force. Um, brought them in as um, writer, staff writers as well, also image consultants because we all know if the people that are watching us live this iconic emblem salt and pepper emblem was created by play who also put together collaborated with dapper dan dapper dan on the um the iconic salt and pepper jackets so we had all of that in house under the idol makers crew and like i was saying so you we really have to look at herbie as part of the of the, the the imprint, the blueprint of what it means like to means to recruit hip hop. If you if you think about it, J Ray, hip hop is based on it's almost like a it's almost like a pyramid scheme. You made a point earlier about how polished mm-hmm. Herbie's acts are, and to me, I agree with you completely. I would consider Herbie Lovebug also a procurer of middle class rap. 
And so what I mean by that is Herbie Azor is the tip is like the perfect immigrant story. He's the the child of he's Haitian born. Okay. His family relocated to the United States to the suburbs of Queens, which plays a huge part because literally he's in the same neighborhood as all of these acts. Right. Except for Dana Dane. Dana Dane is in Brooklyn. But like Sweet Tea is on, in one part of Queens, Kid and Play, um, Salt and Pepper. Everybody's like kind of incubated in this neighborhood. Whereas Jamaica Queens was giving us Run DMC mm-hmm. and LL, which is which are all harder edge acts. And then across the on the other side of the bridge, Queens Bridge, we have the Juice Crew, yep. which is also another harder edge crew, harder music. But like you were saying, J Ray, think about the rapper. Is there a rapper that you identified with when you were growing up? Um, the first rapper that I identified with was Heavy D. Oh, perfect. Well, why do you think you um, reson- why did Heavy D resonate with you? One, I could see myself in him because I was a chubby kid, right? But mm-hmm. two, he could rap, but when you're a kid, you're looking to have a good time and you're looking to have fun. He could rap, but he also had just like party records. Like, you know, we was Mr. Big Stuff in and like doing all of that other stuff. So, yeah, that was why I like kind of identified with him. Like it wasn't, it wasn't to this or to that. It was like right in the middle. And my parents could get into it. Exactly. Our parents, you know, even though my mother was so tired of my wall being plastered with all these <laughs> posters from the from the Write On and the Word Up magazine, like the they were kids next door. Mm-hmm. If I was old enough and lived in Queens and Elmhurst at the time, I probably would have hung out with those guys. I would yeah. have hung out with a kid in play because we all came from middle class backgrounds. Herbie is like pioneering in all kinds of boxes here. He's like checking off a lot of boxes and I don't know if it was intentional or not. I would love to pick his brain. I know he doesn't do a he doesn't do a whole lot of interviews. He doesn't do a lot of public appearances at all, but I would love to pick his brain to see if that was intentional or not. Uh, what was intentional, though, was his relationship with Cheryl James, who mm-hmm. we know as Salt of Salt and Pepper. And um, <laughs> Jerry, when we think about the the term power couple, who do we think of immediately? I mean, Jay Today. and Beyonce. Boom. But when you think about it, who was the first hip hop power couple? Herbie yeah. and Cheryl. Herbie yeah. and Cheryl. When you think about it. Because I, now, okay, I would have okay on the yeah. other end. I would have picked Joe and Sylvia Robinson, but no, really, but for real, yeah, Herbie and Cheryl, huh? Because you know Cheryl was in front of the mic. We yeah. knew who she was. Herbie was their deaf dope producer, as it's written on all of the the back of their album covers. Um, is is well known as well, and it's like yeah, and he never hit it. He never hit it. It's it's written actually on the um on the album Herbie's Machine at the at the bottom. He gives her a special shout out for being his woman and all that mm-hmm. other good stuff. But um, like a Barry Gordy, you know, <laughs> right? Herbie <laughs> had a relationship with the, the who would be considered the leading lady in his rap group. Yep. And so, for better or for worse. That was a thing. They had a relationship and it really gave us some good music. Gave us, I think they gave us the hip hop's first um, power couple. Did you know that the showstopper was originally supposed to be a duet between Herbie and Salt? I had no idea about that. So, how did this become a Salt and Pepper song? I'm really curious about that. So, they did, they touched on it in the, um, the Lifetime movie. That's one of the things I really I appreciated about the movie was that, you know, getting to that um, piece of history. They did touch on that. They actually went to the scene where he's like trying to record this answer record because Herbie knows, Herbie's a businessman. Herbie knows that the best way to get attention is to do an answer record. So he yes. wants to, he's picking on the show yes. by Slick Rick 
and Dougie Fresh. So he's like, okay, we're going, I'm going to get on by answering this record. So as much as he tried, something just wasn't happening. And he had Cheryl there um, in the studio, in the, the bedroom studio, mm-hmm. of course, working on this record, mm-hmm. and it just wasn't clicking. And Sandy Peppa mm-hmm. was always around. Um, it's well known he was he she used to annoy him and you know <laughs> he just thought she was a big pest. But he was like, you know what? I get it was just one of those things. He was like, you know what, let me just try this. And he told her to get in the he was so annoyed by her, she was getting away. He was like, you know what? Get in the booth with Cheryl mm-hmm. and read and try to rap these lyrics. And he, through a lot of coaching, mm-hmm. told told them both, okay, this is what I want you to say, and this is how I want you to say it. And it went to tape. And here's another reason why Herbie was such a go-getter. Herbie knew all the power players. Mm -hmm. Herbie had a relationship with Marley Marl, who was at BLS, Mm -hmm. working with Mr. Magic, who also before that, I think, had another uh, rap show on another, um, like an underground radio station, but was primarily, he was working with Mr. Magic at BLS, which was a huge look back in the day. Because, of course, hip-hop was only played at night. At night. Mm-hmm. and on the weekends mm-hmm. so the um this the showstopper it was actually a school project for herbie and um he just needed this to be done so he got his girlfriend and her bestie to hop on the record so that the project could be finished he liked it gave it to um, marley marl and but also you know had to turn it in but also gave it to marley marl to see if it could get played on the record on the radio marley Mar played it and of course it went berserk you know Cheryl and sandy became the salt and pepper mcs because at first they yeah. were supernature but because of the lyric in the song mm-hmm. because we the salt we'll and like pepper that, MCs, mcs that's how people you know people always say i want that record by them salt and pepper girls <laughs> right and that's, that's the how they became the, the salt and pepper. yeah you know uh, and it's interesting that Marley Marl plays a role in this because, of course, Marley also understands the power of the response record because, of course, his, you know, Roxanne's Revenge was, you know, his, you know, Roxanne was rapping on his his creation. So he understood mm-hmm. what this meant to put this record on, too. So that's an interesting piece of history as well. Absolutely. And. So one thing I, before we segue into the next piece, I so we're talking about the relationship between Herbie Lovebug and Salt. Um, again, in the movie, it was well documented that their relationship, of course, got rocky towards the end. But what he did do for hip hop and do for Salt and Pepper was. I don't know if it was because she was super jealous and was always up under him while he was in the studio, but Salt learned how to produce yeah. by just being shadowing Herbie. And if it wasn't for her shadowing Herbie and learning the things that, you know, him teaching her what this does and what that does and her picking it up and retaining it, we probably would have never gotten expression, which yeah. was their first was her gold record yeah like her production her first production written by her and sandy produced by her turned into the record label and they got a gold record she got her first gold record just by learning at his feet man that's that's dope that's dope history um as well it you know it just i don't know it just ceases to it never ceases to amaze me how much nobody talks about him because there are a lot of things that went down in hip hop that Herbie was there for, was there at the nexus of, and at the creation, you know, so we've got idol makers, which is a a crew, a polished crew, middle-class kids Mm -hmm. rocking, looking preppy, but still rocking the gold, you know, to be fresh and fly, um, performers, um, that have really catchy records yeah. um, that are danceable that people can sing along to. Like, weren't you telling me that, um, what was the Dana Dane song that you first? Oh, send the fella first... Dana Dane. 
Cinderella. You can sing along to that. You can sing along to that joint. I um so uh Dana Dane with fame. My cousin who <laughs> so funny, I was with the cousin that introduced that record to me right before the show. Um she got the tape. So this is like 86. I think that record came out in 86. It might have been 87, but it was like mm-hmm. earlier. And um, she got the Dana Dane with Fame album and she left it at my house by accident. And mm. I was, of course, familiar with hip hop because it was everywhere, but I wasn't yet, I hadn't yet fallen in love. But I played the Dana Dane with Fame album and I will never forget hearing Nightmares. I'll never forget hearing Cinderella Dana Dane and like digging the record. So... Herbie did, he was tapped in to that thing that Quincy Jones talks about, which I think is ear candy too. It's like the thing mm-hmm. you can't explain about why you like a record. Herbie understood that. But also I think one of the reasons as well why people probably don't talk like him is to your earlier point. He doesn't do a lot of interviews, conversations. Like I've never seen anything like that for him. And when you're in this era like people need to see you to know that history but i think that's why q points is here like the hope is that now folks will go and they will start digging into some of these records to hear what herbie was doing You know, there might have been a reason why Herbie stayed low key because not not everybody likes Herbie. Yeah, not everybody <laughs> likes Herbie. Um, <laughs> funny thing is, like J Ray, what is the number one sin? What is the number one cardinal sin in rap music? Okay, I feel like there's kind of two, but I'm a, okay. I'm gonna do the first one. First one is biting. The first mm-hmm. the. First cardinal sin is biting. The second one for an MC is not writing your rhymes. You know what I'm saying? So biting and not writing, even though people did both. So <laughs> clearly, so I think it's so funny to me that Herbie Lovebug is like literally at the root of one of rap's biggest hip hop beefs ever. He okay. So I've heard MC Light tell this story, and who else? Yeah, I, I heard MC Light share the story with Nas. So it's it's confirmed because Light said it herself. The reason why Antoinette, who is um, the only <laughs> MC from the Bronx on the Invincibles, excuse me, on the Idol Makers um, roster, was um was kind of thrown into a battle with MC Light was because Herbie, Herbie Lovebug, was working with up-and-coming producers and two of those up-and-coming producers, if I could speak today, uh, two of these up-and-coming producers was the Audio Audio 2 out of Brooklyn. Oh, you can hear the similarities in the production. I'd never put that together before. So listen, here's the thing. So they were working on a beat. They were working on a record. Uh, they had come up with a, a concept for this record. Um, as a matter of fact, it was supposed to be a response to Top Billing because Top Billing was already a massive hit, yeah. like locally, especially in Brooklyn. Top Billing was already um, already had legs and was going places. So they wanted to, you know, again with the formula, let's do something that will a response or some type of answer to get more people involved and to start to spawn another hit. And so at that time, Herbie and Audio Two were supposed to be collaborating. And so this the beat that you hear in Top Billing is yet another heavily sampled mm-hmm. beat in hip hop, yes. and that's uh, "Impeach the President" by the yeah. Honey Drippers. Mm-hmm. We all know that beat. That beat we've heard it a million times. So the fact that somebody else used that same beat, you would think, what's the big deal? Right. But what happened is Herbie and Audio Two were collaborating on this beat, and this beat was specifically chopped up in a different fashion because it's sped up 
like top billing is sped mm-hmm. up. So they were working on another song that was the answer to it, and it was sped up in another fashion and chopped in a certain way. And Audio 2 had to go with MC Light. They went on tour, mm-hmm. and they were like, okay, we'll hear back from Herbie. Herbie's going to work on it, and then when we get back, we'll, um, we're going to get busy and get to work on this record. They never heard from Herbie. What they did hear on the way back from a show in Boston when they get back to, they cross over the bridge into New York and they pick up um, Mr. Magic's mm-hmm. um, rap attack. They hear the song, the beat that they've been working on with Herbie featuring Antoinette on a record called I Got an Attitude. So, okay. So now this puts 10% diss in perspective. I never knew why they were on the hook with Beat by the. I never. This connected a dot for me that I just didn't know why. This is the Mm -hmm. why. Now it makes sense. Because it was like, why? It was like, it felt almost out of the out of the blue. Why is MC Light attacking Antoinette out Mm -hmm. all of out of the blues? Nobody could figure it out. But if you listen, listener, go back and listen to um to 10% diss. Yeah. In the very beginning, you can hear a recording of Mr. Magic himself saying, all right, now whose beat did you steal this time? And and you can hear Audio 2 saying, oh, snap. Oh, oh that's what I do. Oh. They're like, oh, snap. You know, kick this yep. one because they do the whole thing before the mm-hmm. hot damn hot. Wow. I never knew hear- where that came from. And you hear them say, let's put light on it. Word. Yeah. Because they didn't want it, they didn't want two guys attacking this girl. Yeah. Because it would just look crazy for two dudes to be trying to diss a uh, you know a female MC. So that is how this for its time was a major diss war between MCs, between female MCs at that. But and here's the here's the the part though that oh my heart breaks for Antoinette because that starts her off in a beef that she didn't have nothing to do with. Had absolutely nothing to do with. And then according to her book, her um her memoir, she said that she was placed on the record, not knowing the circumstances behind the record, but made to put out this record which to me is probably one of the hardest one of the hardest 12 inch singles from a a woman mc ever i mean just a beer beat and her spitting because she was crazy yeah antonette is i mean one of the dopest mcs out right Mm -hmm. so it puts her there but she was told that she couldn't respond they told her not to say nothing because I, i don't know if maybe herbie is feeling some kind of way that he realizes, oh, maybe I'm the cause of this. I don't want no friction. But she was told, don't say anything. Until she left her management, because you can see the album right behind you, her debut album, Who's the Boss, Herbie Lovebug is actually nowhere on that album. She was gone from, and I never understood that either, because this is only like a year, a year or so later, and she's already right. out of the camp and has moved on to another crew. And now it mm-hmm. all makes sense because I'm sure she was like, yo, man. Like, what's the, yeah, and that's and so then she was like, well, now that I'm not with Herbie, I'm going to engage in this battle, which did not did not work out for her. No. Great, great rapper, great MC, great. To me, I love that album. Yeah. But because of all the because MC Light already had such a huge following, it just didn't bold the machine. And she had a machine behind her. She had Atlantic Records yeah. behind her. Whereas Antoinette was on a subdivision, a yeah. sub um, a sub label of another That's, label yeah. of another label. She was actually signed to a production deal. She wasn't yeah. even a full-fledged signed artist. So it that's one of those heartbreaking stories to come out of that whole idol makers camp. And she really deserves a lot more um than what she had gotten. But yeah, Herbie, um 
Audio 2 wasn't the first to call Herbie out. Like, Craig G also called Herbie out on the Duck Alert record. If you've ever heard Duck Alert, he plainly says, not Herbie because Herb's a beat biter. And also, which is like a, a little dig, also uses Antoinette sampled in the record saying Duck Alert. <laughs> so not everybody loves Herbie. Not everybody yeah. loves Herbie. As a matter of fact, you one of the people, one of the MCs that I always talk to you about and always wonder where she is, L.A. Star. Mm-hmm. L.A. Star, or another Bronx MC, was like had no problem. She was on the B the B Boy Records label, and she was on the compilation B Girls Live and Kicking. And one of the records that she has on there is calling Herbie out. Well, really, it's a Salt and Pepper disc record, but it's called Write That Rhyme Herbie because Herbie is in charge of everything. Herbie's producing, he's writing, writing everything. So that kind of left Salt and Pepper open for that attack from LA Star on this whole write that rhyme herbie record and it's one of those things it's like damn salt pepper really if not for them having hit records and having more and people knowing who they are more than the la star that really could have hurt them hurt their career hurt their reputation but yeah because herbie was definitely a svengali at this point he (laughs) was in charge of everything and so i you know that I've said all of that to say we we spent a lot of time in in this beginning because Idol Makers is Herbie Lovebug. Yeah. And Herbie Lovebug is synonymous with Idol Makers. Like he I wanted you listeners to know the full impact of what that man was doing behind the scenes to really put these kids on, these teenagers on from Queens to literally change the culture and push hip hop forward into a more um into uh, a, a more iconic phase because t- was not for him we wouldn't have gotten house party yep and again if not for him we would not have the probably the only remaining and still feasible and successful female hip-hop groups ever twere not for her i said twer y'all <laughs> we're not for herbie love bug azer and wow. so that you know we and now you and i we were talking about herbie you talked about the album yeah. um herbie's machine and we're gonna go get into that on the other side of this break because you finally got a chance to listen to it i got to listen full. to it so yeah we're gonna talk about the record after we come back from this break but i want to shout you out though for this like amazing history that you just dropped you connected so many dots for me about the why and because i will never forget i remember when i had the 10 percent disc 12 inch and i remember the world mm-hmm. premiere and then premiere. you can hear them in the back and da 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 no kicked it at, it makes so much sense now thank yeah. you professor uncle sir daniel <laughs> for giving the kids what they needed and um Yo, we'll see y'all on the other side of this break. What's the word, everybody? It's your man, Mr. Al Peter, Mr. Peterson's Neighborhood and the NPN Network. And I'm here today to tell you about what the NPN Network consists of. The NPN Network is an entertainment as well as a developing media company based in Jacksonville, Florida. Our goal is to highlight various creatives that exist in spaces of music, visual arts, podcasting, and more. Within the network, we have multiple brands that will parallel with creatives, events, and other brands. The Neighborhood Podcast Network is a collective of independent podcast shows that has various topics ranging from the latest culture news, mental health, sports, and leisure conversations. We also have the Groove Suite brand that explores the realm of soul, hip-hop, R&B, funk, and more. Our health and beauty section gives a view on how to keep yourself in shape in style, and in tune with your body and your mental. Last, we have the Fly Socks and Tees, an annual summer event that brings creatives together to celebrate the past years and victories that were received. So swing by our website, mpn-llc.com, and subscribe so you can stay up on what's happening with the neighbors and the groovers. Also, follow us on our Facebook page as well as Instagram and Twitter, MPN Management. Building but becoming to the top. 
What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Shout out to Mr. Al Pete and the MPN Network. Mr. Al Pete just celebrated a birthday um, before we recorded this show. So happy birthday, brother. Uh, We appreciate you. And um, thank you all for coming back uh, to the next uh, part of this show. DJ Sir Daniel just gave us an amazing rundown of the Idolmakers crew and the impact of Hervey (laughs) <laughs> Hervey, Herbie right. Lovebug, Azor, and um, now we're gonna come into uh into a thing. So it's in 1988. We've been celebrating 1988 all year. So it's been our hip hop 50 as well as our 1988 um celebration all year. And one of the albums that happened to come out in 88 was a compilation record called Herbie's Machine. Now I knew about the album but i learned about it way later i only knew i got an attitude and i knew i got an attitude was on herbie's machine but i also knew it as a 12 inch too so i had never pursued hearing the record none of that until getting ready for this show but herbie's machine was released in 1988 and we just wanted to spend some time talking a bit about that record too it's a it's an important record because I believe it's one of, if I'm not mistaken, the only other c- compilation, hip hop compilation by, that was put together by a singular producer, the uh, in-house producer and his roster of artists. The only other record that I could think of is the Uptown's Kicking It record, mm-hmm. which is also a compilation that features, you know, your Finescence and Quiz, Heavy D and the Boys, um, Marley Marl, so on and so forth. That's the only one, and I'm willing to Marley venture. Marley Marl think... hadn't come out like the um, what was it, the In Control record with the symphony that hadn't come out yet, had it? No, no, mm-hmm. that that came out before that because Bass Game, um, the Finesse and Quiz record is a is like a 1986 release, if okay. I'm not mistaken. So we're so yeah, so I think that might have come out before, but like we're saying, Herbie Lovebug, and before I go further. J. Ray, we can't not speak on how Herbie Lovebug interpolated go-go music Mm -hmm. into hip-hop. I'm not saying he was the first and only person to do it, but his his touch gave us some really classic records. My Mic Sound Nice is a go-go record, Mm -hmm. hands down, samples the Junkyard Band. Yeah. And that doesn't get more go-go than that. And what's unique about that, too, is, yes, there are a lot of samples in this stuff, but there wasn't a lot of that in hip-hop at the time. Because when I'm thinking about 88 in hip-hop, you, of course, have Herbie Lovebug. You have what Marley Marl is doing. You have Mantronic, who's out there doing stuff as well. And um, this stood separate. This was like a different sort of thing. Herbie had a unique touch, and I think his unique touch was the go-go influence. Absolutely. So I just wanted to make sure that we, you know, shout him out for that because I can't think of prior to that, um, a lot of records. Well, no, again, there were some records that have a go-go influence, but he brought in go-go bands. Yeah. And they went and they went on tour with go-go bands. That's how we got the um the salt and pepper and eu Mm -hmm. collaboration of shake your thing so shout out to him so the actual album herbie's machine was released on soundcheck which was a subsidiary of next plateau records so like i mentioned earlier soundcheck um was the home of where antoinette was doing her 12 inch really um 12 inches were released so i think like i said earlier herbie was also negotiating these deals and brokering these deals and getting, <laughs> we know you know, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, saying, listen, you allow me to put out a record. I'm going to give you um, the follow-up to Salt and Pepper's records. Cause at yeah. that point, after the showstopper, we got, um, what did we get after Trent. we got the showstopper we got no we got my mic sounds nice, nice. Mm-hmm. we got i'll take your man mm-hmm. and they those were like street records they did okay but they weren't that hit and so like you just said tramp 
was going to be his the next release for salt and pepper but as legend has it herbie was like we need herbie's always thinking ahead Mm -hmm. we need something on the radio we need a hit we need something that's going to be infectious yep and that's how you got they were at um uh fresh gordon's apartment recording that song and they're in his bedroom and they you know they get that they do the um the the keyboard dun, 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 mm-hmm. and everybody's like what is this you know this is a pop is record, record? <laughs> and and that's probably exactly why everybody was scrunching up their faces like mm, we just did i'll take your man you want us to do this i'm oh, sure whatever so they went into the bathroom and recorded this hit so i think push it was getting was great gaining some traction right as a 12 inch and as the b-side to tramp Mm -hmm. and the only way and tramp was flipped over by a dj out in san francisco Uh, that that's a legend that everybody knows that story who put who flipped it over and played it and so the record starts taking off so what he did i believe he took he said said to next plateau okay i got salt and pepper's next big hit but I want a, a compilation album and here you can have push it for this album as long as we get to, I get to sign people and then I get, yeah. you know, to sign Salt and Pepper to the next plateau, all this stuff. And so we got, I'm thinking that push it was used to broker a deal because push it is the, it's probably the best known song aside from I got an attitude on that album. Yeah, um, I was actually surprised. I did not know that um, Push It uh, appeared on this compilation album. The Push It remix mm-hmm. uh, appeared on the record. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, w- I would almost guarantee that that was the conversation and that's how that went. You know what? And you know what? Um, actually, Carlton just reminded me of this fact. Right. So we know that it was added because the original Hot, Cool, and Vicious, which was Salt and Pepper's um, mm-hmm. debut album, does not have Push It Push on it. Push It on it, yeah. It does not have Push It on it. It has all those records we talked about before, but Herbie said, we need a hit. And so I guess this was a, a renegotiation tool. Hey, we got this pop records. It's buzzing on the streets. Can we add it? You know, let's add the remix on to the... Um, so the album which will boost more of your mm-hmm. sales i need more money i need to we need more money i need a production deal i'm signing people left and right here's how we this is how herbie gets his foot and we see this first this is kind of like the, one of the first deals negotiated if we think about it mm-hmm. people always stop they think puffy is where mm-hmm. negotiations for big multi-million dollars dollar um deals starts and ends no it may not have been multi multiple millions right but it was a a deal that got salt and pepper out of there got them on and quite frankly the label next plateau really has salt and pepper to thank for keeping the lights on oh yeah they're the house that salt and pepper built point blank period there's no other artist on that label that was more impactful than salt and pepper or even memorable i only know um uh, i know that antoinette was signed there i know mm-hmm. i think sybil was signed there yes sybil was signed there and those paperboy the, and paperboy those are those are diddy it. that's all i know <laughs> and that's it <laughs> so so again to his credit and to his genius you know and and knowledge i don't even know where he where he got this but like he he really was ahead of the game and negotiating these deals but so let's just get into the album mm-hmm. though jerry you've had an mm-hmm. opportunity to listen to it do you have a favorite cut yeah i got an attitude <laughs> yes um actually still knocks and mm-hmm. i i felt disappointed that Antoinette couldn't have had more time to bake and cook and find her way. But now, given the story that you told in in segment one, I get how that was just like messed up for her. Like she ended up in the middle of something that she couldn't climb out of, right? Mm -hmm. But 
I got an attitude is like, you want to set up a career? This is how you do a rap career in the 80s. And I also reflect on, I didn't buy into the whole female rock him thing, which is, you know, of course they were, they were doing that back then, but yeah. listening to, I got an attitude with 2023 fresh ears was like, Oh, I get why people were making this comparison at that moment. For yeah. certain. Yeah. Definitely had the, the cadence, the cadence, the, um, the breath control and yeah, the rapping was like for the her flow. diaphragm. Yeah. Cause her speaking voice is nothing like her rapping voice. <laughs> right. I can imagine, you know, so shout out to her. So I, I, I agree with you. I absolutely love. I got an attitude, um, but nonstop keep him stepping. That was fun. Is is a fun record. It's nothing lyrically mm-hmm. like stands out. Uh, I would have loved to see more from nonstop because they. It was a trio. Yep. Um, I be, I don't know if they. There was another nonstop a group called nonstop, which was another group of female MCs that had a 12 inch on Tommy boy and Jazzy Joyce actually backed them up. She's, um, they mentioned her on the record, the um, nonstop trio or no sweet trio, or they had a record called nonstop. I can't, can't remember right now, but I said all that to say, I wish that they could have gotten another chance. Cause I would have loved to have seen what another, um, women group out of Herbie's camp would have looked and sounded like. Yeah. Now, Carter's Cut, now what we learned from the biopic, from the Salt and Pepper biopic, that maybe Salt had <laughs> put the kibosh. We don't know. All of these girls, right. Because so she was like, I don't know who are all these girls. They who, right. Who, who, we the girls. Right. Latoya Hansen, who was the original Spinderella, Salt got her all the way up <laughs> out of here for even looking at Herbie. So, She's Who on the knows? cover, by the way, for How Cool and Vicious. <laughs> yes. Yep. Before they brought on Dee Dee, who is mm-hmm. who we know and love as Spinderella after these 30 plus years of being in the business. Yes. But yeah, I loved um, Keep Him Stepping by Nonstop. But I also loved um, Let the Drummer Get Ill because yeah. the the chop, the beat chopping up on that on that record, simplistic, but really dope. Um, which was what Herbie was known for. And again, those break beats and making them his own really was the thing. So those are the two album records that stood out to me. Now, I have never publicly, so I had to re-listen to the album myself. Mm-hmm. And I will say that very last track by Future, Shot yeah. Let's Go, what in the planet rock <laughs> was that? Because that's literally... It was literally a rip of, of basically a planet rip rock. Of, yeah and I, that's probably so here's my guess here's my guess because mm-hmm. i did have to sit with this i think what we ended up getting on this compilation were things that had been worked on over time so that record was probably done closer to like 85 86 right it was probably already in the can because there are things on this album that sound like really fresh in a, that moment and then mm-hmm. there are things that are like this sounds like an era right before so i wonder if um i wonder what the motivation was behind putting out herbie's machine and what was it designed to sell um and maybe it was just designed to sell herbie Lovebug as a producer here are the different types of things that i can do you know what i'm saying and I wrote, I wrote probably all of this stuff on here, right? So I want to collect a check from whatever comes out. I will tell you what surprised me because I was fully, I was fully expecting it to not land. But the the Mau Mau uh, clan, uh, sorry, oh, mm-hmm. the Mau Mau, the Mau Mau o- clan overlords, yes, totally. I was like, oh, I don't mind these songs. I actually spent a good hour trying to nail down who the heck was in this group and there's no information there's a re i am so glad you said that because (laughs) i think i've cut i've cracked the code on this 
because I listened to it again with fresh ears, like you said, mm-hmm. and it's specifically on the house that rap built. Mm -hmm. so one herbie is trying his hand at rapping as well so that's clearly herbie's voice on the record his brother stevie o who is um who is his right hand man his Mm -hmm. he's actually pictured here on the cover Cover. Mm -hmm. that's his twin they say they're twins i don't know if they're twins but they're um but his brother is definitely featured on as a writer and producer on a lot of the idol maker records as well right I also hear, go back and listen to this, J-Ray. I hear kid. Okay, so you heard kid. I was like, is this play or kid? Okay, so I wasn't crazy because I'm like, and I did look this up. I'm like, maybe that's what was happening. But, okay, so I have a theory. Uh Uh-huh. Follow me on this. So who's featured on this compilation album? Antoinette, Mm -hmm. Salt and Pepper, Nonstop. The Fabulous Two, The Super Lovers, who is really just um, Herbie and his brother, brother. quite uh, honestly. That's Herbie. Herbie's Herbie's onto something. Herbie's like, I can do all this stuff under all these different monikers. Right. Like Prince. And get paid. And And get get paid. paid. Right. So so Future Shot, the Mau Mau Clan Overlords. Who is not featured on the album, J-Ray? There's no Sweet Tea. There's Mm -hmm. no Kid and Play. There's no Dana Dane. And these are all artists who we know. Who we absolutely know. But what do Kid and Play, Sweet Tea, and Dana Dane all have in common? They were signed to Profile. They they were signed to Profile (laughs) Records. They were already established and signed, had their own label deals with Profile Records. So I'm figuring the reason why he had to pad out this album was because he couldn't get releases for these artists to be appear on the record so he created uh the mau mau clan overlords with no pictures no we literally don't hear you can hear yeah but you can hearly hear click kids voice on this record and i'm pretty certain helped write on this record and everything so that my dear that's my theory on um <laughs> I feel like I've cracked the code here, but that's my theory on the whole Herbie's machine, the house that rap built. I still think it's an important record because it it showed what the potential of what hip hop um was going to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it gave us a blueprint of what the importance of showing a united front mm-hmm. and showing um what how successful um, creating a sound yeah. that is organic and and germane to your crew, original to your crew, how impactful that can be in an industry where you're trying to stand out. Yes. So again, I feel like we have to tip our hat to Herbie Lovebug, Herbie Lovebug Azor. Uh-huh. Um, my last question to you, J. Ray, 10 out of 10, what would you rate Herbie's Machine? Five and a half. Five, Five and, and a half. half. Okay. Yeah. I would give it a, I would give it a solid seven. Okay. I'll give it, a, I gave them, I gave them two points because of I Got an Attitude, <laughs> which again, like still stands the test of time. Like, mm-hmm. God, I think you, I think if you ask Nas, you ask any of the forefathers, uh, people who we consider lyricists and real spitters. You ask them about that record, and they, they they'll go, "Oh man, yeah, yeah." yeah. They'll say that that was a dope record. So I encourage you, Jay Ray, and I encourage you, listener, to just do a little research. We're mm-hmm. celebrating hip hop's 50th anniversary. I think you definitely need to give Herbie some flowers and check out everything that he has Mm -hmm. um given to this culture yeah we'll make sure to put um so in the description y'all will find uh links to a playlist for herbie's machine herbie's machine has been out of print um for a very long time and it still is but um some folks have compiled songs of course on youtube so we'll make sure that that is included there's also a really great um article in rock the bells um, yes. which talks about um which highlights like their 10 favorite Herbie productions 
Um, and so we'll include that as well. So you can revisit some of the joints uh, produced and written and uh, guided by Herbie Lovebug. That's right. So, I, you know, thank you, Jay Ray. Thank you for allowing me to, you know, to get to Give get it up my, to Sir Daniel. Give it up. You were amazing. Get, this was really good. <laughs> to get my idol makers rocks off here because that it's a story. I just believe, you know, if we talk about cruise, people are always talking about cruise. Mm-hmm. You got to go to the Nexus. You really got, if you're going to talk about cruise, talk about them. Yeah. And really give this man some credit. Um, Jay Ray, just let the listener know what they need to do because the listener re- needs to to give us five stars this Absol- is a five star show oh my god you absolutely should give us five stars <laughs> so thank y'all so much for um being here um as we said if you are listening if you are watching go ahead and subscribe wherever you are um and definitely leave us reviews um it is incredibly important that we get your Uh, reviews we get your star ratings um because that is ways that people get to discover the show as well so definitely head on over to your apple podcast your pod chaser and if you're listening to us on spotify um you can do it there as well so leave us a star rating and review that would be amazing and um yeah uh, get with us on our website as well. You can become a Q Points Insider on the website by clicking subscribe, shop the store, definitely get on that mailing list though. So on the mailing list, we will make sure that we include um, some of our favorite joints um, from Herbie Lovebug as well. So some of them you might know, some of them you might not know. So get on the mailing list. And when we send out the email um, about this show, you can get that. So, um, and uh, yeah. 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 Um, thank you, listener. Uh, real quick, I know we did not say anything about Kwame, but we didn't. Um, yep. We did not, but the reason is Kwame came way later. For all intents and purposes, was his own man, his own machine. Yeah. Kwame did a lot of his own production and came mm-hmm. to Herbie with a lot of his own production, but he was definitely is definitely part of the Idol Makers crew and a part of that legacy and heritage. Um Jackie McGee, one of my favorite yeah. records by her, is done by Herbie Lovebug called Skeezer. Mm-hmm. So Skeezer. he's <laughs> exactly that record was just so, re-released actually on digital platforms. So you can oh. check out the Jackie McGee record. It came out about uh, a month ago. It's on Spotify. Nice. So Jerry, what do I always say in this life? You have an option. You can either pick up the needle or you can let the record play. I am DJ Sir Daniel. My name is Jay Ray, y'all. This is Q Points Podcast, dropping the needle on Black music history. We will see you on the next go-round. Peace. Peace, y'all.